Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. Monday night kicked off the Republican convention in Cleveland. The theme of the evening was Make America Safe Again. And how will Donald Trump and his allies accomplish this? Well, according to our next clip, Americas live in fear. And here's Rudy Giuliani. The vast majority of Americans today do not feel safe. They fear for their children. They fear for themselves. They fear for our police officers who are being targeted with a target on their back. It's time to make America safe again. It's time to make America one again. One America! What happened? What happened to? What happened to? There's no black America. There's no white America. There is just America. What happened to it? Where did it go? How has it flown away? The symbol of uh, and spokesperson at the convention for American policing and how this safety will be regained, how to regain the America Giuliani is talking about, was Sheriff David Clark, the sheriff of Milwaukee County. Here's what he had to say. What we witnessed in Ferguson, in Baltimore, and Baton Rouge was a collapse of the social order. So many of the actions of the Occupy movement and Black Lives Matter transcends peaceful protests and violates the code of conduct we rely on. I call it anarchy. People live in fear. We're on the edge of anarchy. Sounds like the language from the late 1940s and early 1950s during McCarthyism and the House of Un-American Activities Committee. Then it was, I was a communist for the FBI. That was on television. We were all living in fear every day. The world was going to explode and we needed the American military. Now the country's about to unravel and we need a strong police force and a stronger social order. Now joining us to talk about the Republican convention, the candidacy of Donald Trump, and whether or not this represents a form of neo-fascism in the United States, is Henry Giraud. Henry joins us from Hamilton, Ontario, where he's a professor of scholarship in the public interest at McMaster University. And his most recent book, Disposable Futures, The Seduction of Violence in the Age of Spectacle, and a new book about to come out, America at War with Itself. He's a regular contributor at Truthout. Thanks very much for joining us, Henry. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Paul. So th there's a, a real debate going on in, in, um, amongst much of America, certainly progressive, liberal uh, America, about whether or not uh, Trump and his candidacy, first of all, does it represent a form of neo-fascism? And then second of all, it, 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 this issue of greater and lesser evil vis-a-vis -vis Trump and Clinton. But let's start with part one of this debate, which is, is this a form of, of, of neo-fascism or is this kind of a maverick, big personality, right populist who kind of actually speaks in some ways to some of the economic concerns of the American working class? I, I think it's very difficult to simply see Trump as some sort of eccentric populist who sort of came out of nowhere and was able to identify some of the concerns that a number of Americans have about being left out of a system that basically celebrates everything that the financial elite finds rewarding. I mean, I, I think the, the forces at work that have created Trump have been sort of brewing for a long time. And I think it is a form of neo-fascism. I would call it a, form of, a new form of American authoritarianism. I mean, it mimics many of the things that we saw in the 30s and the 40s, what we saw in Argentina, you know, the call to make American, America great again, the notion that shared fears are more important than shared, shared responsibilities, the assumption that there are people both in the United States and abroad who represent some kind of common enemy, whether they're Muslims, or, you know, whether they're the Black Lives Movement, whether they're protesters, whether they're young people, uh, whether they're immigrants. I mean, this is a very decisive, dangerous language. I mean, it, what does it mean to have a candidate who basically celebrates war crimes? What does it mean to have a candidate who basically sees dissent as basically unpatriotic or 
a candidate who refuses to speak to the fact that much of his following and an increasing number of his followers are white nationalists and neo-Nazis. Uh, it, it's pretty hard to simply suggest that Trump is, is, is simply an eccentric populist. I mean, I, I don't buy that. And I, I think we need to look deep into the history of this country, whether we're talking about its beginning right up until Reagan in the 1980s to recognize the forces at work. I mean, this, this is a system that radiates violence. And he's become the most outspoken apologist for it. The uh, language uh, that we just played, the clips, uh, especially, I thought, from the sheriff, David Clark, um, this, this is word for word out of Hitlerite language, the fear of anarchy, we must reinforce the social order. Um, he had a fairly uh, well uh, viraled argument with a CNN host where he actually even denied uh, that, that blacks are, are targeted uh, more often than whites are by uh, either in being stopped by police officers in cars uh, and so on, you know, driving while black, as it's called. Um, the out-and-out out kind of uh, lies that can be told, the out-and-out out denial of just basic evidence of what's going on, uh, that they've been able through the, through the various media, Fox and, and otherwise, a significant section of the American people, and apparently uh, maybe half of American voters, although I think it's important to always remind everyone that leaves out about 40 percent of people who don't vote, uh, but a significant amount of American people are, are so willing to uh, believe that this is somehow in their interest, um, and, and this, uh, the, the, this tills the soil for a much more overt and barbaric form of hypercapitalism. Uh, I, I think you're absolutely right, and I think you've hit on something that, in many ways, the left has seemed to ignore, and that is, you know, the crisis of politics, the crisis of agency, the crisis of history, the crisis of ethics is not being matched by a crisis of ideas. I, I mean, we don't realize the, the degree to which education has become central to politics itself in ways that speak to cultural apparatuses that, uh, you know, that dominate the mainstream media and other sources that are constantly producing what I call a disimagination machine, one in which evidence doesn't matter, reason is, is, is simply uh, ignored, evidence, is, again, is thrown out the window, uh, civic literacy is, is, is viewed as a liability, that it's more important basically to be, to be stupid than to think. I mean, you know, Hannah Haran had said something interesting, I mean, among other things. She said that thoughtful, thoughtlessness is the essence of fascism. And I, and I think the right understands this. And I think the right uses the media as a giant pedagogical machine to constantly, constantly reproduce lies to appeal to the basis instincts of the American public, to distort history, to erase all those public spheres where actually matters of thoughtfulness and critical dialogue and engagement can actually take place. I mean, this is one of the reasons we see the attack on schools. Schools are not being attacked because they're failing. They're being attacked because they're public, because they, they, they represent a public sphere that offers a threat to the very thing that you're talking about this massive right-wing disimagination machine, whether we're talking about the media or whether we're talking about conservative institutes or whether we're talking about the corporatization of education or whether we're talking about the Koch brothers and all these foundations, these people are engaged in a massive attempt to erase history, to erase memory, to basically live in the, instant, the, the, the moment. And in fact, to convince people that the truth really is nothing more than an opinion. And I think there's a, a, another piece to this, which we're starting to see more revealed during this convention, which is the, the ideological tilling the soil for this kind of more overt uh, authoritarianism or neo-fascism is one very important piece. But if you actually look at the political alliances Trump is making, um, you can see how he, he might execute on these things. Uh, it was only just a few weeks ago that Sheldon Adelson, uh, the uh, you know, far-right uh, Likud, far-right Zionist supporter, uh, pledged about $25 million to the Trump campaign. Well, you can see that's one set of alliances. The fact that he picks Pence as his vice president, uh, Pence is a, 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 couldn't be more pro-Likud and pro-right-wing Zionist than, than Adelson. I mean, Pence is in the same you know, political camp. Um, Pence is also very connected to the Koch brothers, so he's now maybe made peace with the Koch brothers, who didn't know whether to trust him in the first place. Now the Republican establishment see Pence as sort of their man in the game there. 
And Pence's biggest message uh, in the 60 Minutes interview, sorry we don't have the clip right now, but essentially on international affairs, his fundamental message was the source of all international chaos, disturbance, and so on is a weakening of American power. And, and the solution is to increase American power. That's part of making America great again. And part of that is, is echoing the, uh, again, Netanyahu's uh, railing against the agreement, Obama's agreement with Iran. Uh, and this was uh, espoused at the convention by Rudy Giuliani again. So let's, here's a clip from uh, Giuliani about how he thinks world affairs should be dealt with. To defeat Islamic extremist terrorists, we must put them on defense. If they are at war against us, which they have declared, we must commit ourselves to unconditional victory against them. This includes undoing one of the worst deals America ever made, Obama's nuclear agreement with Iran that will eventually, that will eventually let them become a nuclear power and ha is putting billions of dollars back into a country that's the world's largest supporter of terrorism. We are actually giving them the money to fund the terrorists who are killing us and our allies. We are giving them the money. Are we crazy? The, the number of lies in that one short clip is, is somewhat astounding. Uh, clearly, if, if there's any one country that is funding terrorism that is coming to attack America, it's Saudi Arabia, not Iran. And it's obvious, anyone that knows anything about the region knows Iran is, in fact, kind of a balance against Saudi Arabia and is actually allied with the United States, both in terms of fighting the Taliban in Afghanistan, uh, fighting, uh, you know, terrorist tactics and extreme uh, uh, Islamic al-Qaeda-type forces in Iraq, uh, and, and so on, and, and that the uh, agreement with Iran is probably the only real significant foreign policy accomplishment that was any good under the Obama administration. But the fact that that gets conflated with Iran is the one financing the terrorists that are coming to attack America is ridiculous when we... When, anyone knows it's the Saudis and, to some extent, the Qataris and, and maybe uh, Kuwait. Uh, as well, the, the, the fundamental issue of unconditional war. What does unconditional war mean? It means what? Massive troops? It means carpet bombing? It means nuclear weapons? I mean, that, that seems to be what the definition of uh, what, what unconditional war would mean. Hyper-aggressive foreign policy talk. Even though, I, I, go, I, go think, ahead, Henry. I, I think that what's interesting here, and what you've touched upon eloquently, is that you know you live in we now live in a society in which politics is an extension of war, and and I and I think that what that speaks to is a form of militarization that not only characterizes an obscene foreign policy, one in which has resulted, as we all know, in 1.2 million deaths as a result of since 9/11, as a result of the. Uh, the, the military, the, the warfare, that, the, the wars that are being waged in Afghanistan, Iraq, and, and Pakistan. But I think the other side of this is that when, war, when, when politics becomes an extension of war, then the war comes home. I mean, the same kind of militarization that dominates that sort of mindset, the notion that violence is basically the, the ultimate form of mediation and, and is used to address almost every problem on both a foreign and domestic front, you begin to see the contours of fascism, neo-fascism, more clearly. I mean, think about what that means at home. You have the rise of a punishing state. You have increasingly a number of institutions that are being modeled after prisons. You have the criminalization of social behavior. You have a country steeped in lawlessness. You have cities being turned into war zones, particularly those occupied by minorities of class and color. You have a police force that seems to act with impunity. And then you hear this discourse. And this discourse of, is one that is not only incredibly distorting, but it's one that basically is, is saying that, hey, look, state and domestic and foreign terrorism 
are really the same coin off how we're going to define ourselves. And I don't think that that discourse is simply aimed at, 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 at you know, the, the right-wing populace who support Trump. I think it's also a way of saying to everybody else, watch out. Uh, you should be fearful because we're going to use every instrument of warfare, every militarized instrument, every war technology, every mode of surveillance that we can to make sure that you understand that dissent in this America, in that America, is basically unpatriotic. You're right. It does echo the 50s. It does echo the, the, the 1930s. But it also echoes something else. It echoes what went on in Argentina, uh, in, 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 in Chile, when people started disappearing. This is the politics of disappearance. This is a politics, the end point of which are concentration camps. This is the end point of the end point here, internment centers. This is the death of democracy. This is not. A, this is not basically a struggle over populism, right wing or whatever. This is a struggle over whether you want to live in a democracy or not. The uh, the, the big lies in Giuliani's speech are at the same scale, never mind of Hitler, uh, but but of Cheney and Bush when they say Saddam Hussein supported Al Qaeda, when. Later, even they had to admit that wasn't true to some extent. They had to admit, but it was clearly there was no support for Al Qaeda. This this defense of uh, not talking about Saudi Arabia, the targeting of Iran, this is clearly the agenda of a Sheldon Adelson. This is this is Likud yeah. to switch yeah. switch and bait to talk about terrorism and then target Iran, which means that's the kind of foreign policy that we're likely to see under under the. Uh, um, under a Trump presidency, and this is what he's surrounding himself Trump's with. I think entirely right on this. I mean, the foreign policy that we're going to see under a Trump presidency is one in, in which there is an enormous potential, not only for massive wars all over the planet, but also for a nuclear holocaust. I mean, I mean, you know, there are two, the two major threats, it seems to me, that the world faces. One is the possibility of a nuclear war, and secondly, of course, the environmental crisis. And I, and I, and I think that... When I think of how stupid Trump is, when I, when I think of the people he surrounds himself with, when I think of the bellicosity and the lies that informs almost everything that he does, and I think of a media that doesn't hold him accountable, except for the alternative media, like your show. I mean, then it's not surprising that questions of war and questions of injustice, the United States is a breeding ground for injustice and domestic terrorism. This all becomes normalized. You know, it seems to exist in a kind of void that neoliberals have created in which they tend to believe that political and economic activity uh, it, it has no social cost. You don't have to talk about its accountability. When accountability dies, lawlessness emerges. And I think that's what we have here. We have a party of utter lawlessness in its most abject, unapologetic form. Right. And, and the media treats these, this election coverage as they, they have to have a kind of sort of balance. They, have, they can't go too hard after the Republicans or they'll be seen as being partisan to the Democrats. Um, this is a part of what's underneath this. I've been pointing out in some of my stuff recently. They, they earn about six billion dollars a year in election advertising and, and perhaps more in, in a year like this. Uh, so they have a very deep economic interest in, in creating this supposed yeah. sense, sense of balance uh, in this coverage. Uh, but uh, both of us in our writings have been pointing out that all of this Trump phenomena, this rise of neo-fascism, which is more than a Trump phenomena, it's all enabled by eight years of, of Obama, and then you can throw in uh, Bush, and you can certainly throw in Clinton and so on, and back, as you say, to, you, know, it, you know, at the beginning of this hyper-capitalism under Reagan. It's this massive shift of wealth from, from ordinary working people to the very top percentile. Uh, that is what's created the conditions for this rise. So this puts progressives and people that, that want to oppose this neo-fascism into sort of a rock and a, between a rock and a hard place because you know it's precisely the Clinton-esque type forces, uh, in, which includes Barack Obama, uh, by their the way they manage the capitalist crisis so in the favor of Wall Street and such, even if they might throw the odd crumb here and there, to ordinary people, that helps create the conditions for all of this. So we're going to do a part two of this interview, and uh, in that we're going to talk about the enablers of neo-fascism. And, and where that leaves everybody in terms of what they're going to do next. So please join us for part two with Henry Giraud on The Real News Network.